Hello everyone. This video is about Chapter Two, Methods for Describing Set of Data. In this chapter, I will present both methods for describing the qualitative data and quantitative data. They play an important role in statistics. Now I'll introduce the methods. For describing the qualitative data, there are three methods: frequency tables, bar chart, and pie chart. Now, let's see the frequency table first. Qualitative data are non-numerical in nature, thus. The value of a qualitative variable can only be classified into categories called classes. We can summarize such data into two ways. First, by computing the class frequency, the number of observations in the data set that fall into each class, or two. By computing the class relative frequency, the proportion of the total number of observations following into each class, which is the class frequency divided by the total number of observations in the data set. The class percentage is that we translate the class relative frequency into percentage. Although the frequency table describes the data, we often want a graphical presentation as well. The most two widely used graphical methods for describing qualitative data are bar chart and pie chart. This figure shows the frequencies of the three types of a feature in a bar graph. Note that. The height of the bar is equal to the class frequency. We also use pie chart to show the relative frequencies. Note that the pie is a circle, and the size of the pie slice assigned to each class is proportional to the class relative frequency. However, the information produced in the pie chart sometimes will be limited if the categories in the dataset are large. Also, if each category has very similar number of observations, we prefer bar chart, which seems provide us more information. To describe the quantitative data, we also have three methods: dot plot, stem and leaf discipline, and histogram plot. Here is another example of a set of data of EPA mileage renting on 100 cars. A dot plot for the 100 EPA mileage rankings is shown in this figure. The horizontal axis of the figure is a scale for the quantitative variables. The numerical value of each observation is located on the horizontal scale by a dot. When data values repeat, the dots. Are placed above one another vertically. Another graphical representation of the data is stem and leaf display. In this display, the left side is the stem, and the right side is the leaf. Step one. Rank all the data from smallest to largest. 
Step 2. Select a reasonable stem. For the unit of stems, usually in ones, tens, or hundreds. You should define the unit of the stem. For example, if you define the stem unit as ones, then 30 here will be 30. If you define the stem unit as tens, then 30 here will be 300. Step 3. Enter every value as a leaf. Remember, only one number in the leaf side, so numbers may be chunked or rounded. Now I will introduce another graphical method, histograms. Let's see the steps for this. Firstly, find out the maximum and minimum numbers. Then the range of x-axis will be maximum minus minimum. After that, create reasonable class intervals, usually in ones, fifths, tens, or one hundreds. Note that all the class intervals should be the same width. Lastly, count the frequency for each class interval on the y-axis. Now that we've examined some graphical techniques for summarizing and describing quantitative data set, we turn to numerical methods for accomplishing that objective. Mean, median, mode are three numerical measures of central tendency. Here is the definition of mean. We have population mean and sample mean as follows. Mu is the population mean. Well, sigma is the summation of the all x value and n is the number in the population. Sample mean is denoted as x bar and n is the number in the sample. The median is defined as the middle number when the measurements are arranged in order. So firstly, order the values from the lowest to highest. If n is odd, find out the middle number. If n is even, find out the middle two numbers and then take the average of the two numbers. Sometimes the data set will be skewed if one tail of the distribution has more extreme observations than the other tail. If the mean is on the right side of the median, we say that it is right skewed. That is, mean is larger than the median. If mean equals to median, the data set is symmetric. If the mean is on the left side of the median, we say that it is left skewed. That is, mean is smaller than median. A third measure of central tendency is the mode of a set of data. The mode is the measurement that occurs most frequently in the data set. Here are three examples. In the first data set, five occurs most frequently. 
So the mode is five. In the second data set, both four and five occur most frequently, three times. So the mode is four and five. In the third data set, all the values occur the same time, then we say no mode. So mode can be more than one or no mode. Measure of central tendency provide only a partial description of a quantitative data set. We need a measure of variability as well as a measure of central tendency to describe a data set. There are three numerical measures of variability, range, variance, and standard deviation. Perhaps the simplest measure of the variability is its range, which is equal to the largest measurement minus the smallest measurement. The range is easy to compute and easy to understand. Now let's see a measure which is more sensitive than the range, variance. We will have population variance and sample variance. Sigma squared denotes the population variance, while well, sigma here is the summation of the all values and divided by n, the number in the population. The sample variance is a bit different, divided by n minus 1. The standard deviation is just the square root of variance. Sigma denotes the population standard deviation, and S denotes the sample standard deviation. Now you can practice using the calculator. Instructions are on the page 106 in our textbook, and also you can find it on canvas. Now I give you the simple summary. Mu is the population mean. X bar is the sample mean. S squared denotes the sample variance and S denotes the sample standard deviation. Sigma squared denotes the population variance and sigma denotes the population standard deviation. Another new definition is percentile. That is, for any set of n numbers, the pth percentile is a number such that p percent of the measurements fall below that number, and 100 minus p percent fall above it. Therefore, it's about the position. You can find out this position by this formula. The 25th percentile we call the first quantile, Q1. The 50th percentile is the media. And the seven-fifth percentile we call the third quantile, Q3. How to detect outliers? You can detect them by graph or by z-scores. We can use box plot as shown. Here is Q1, medium, and Q3.
and oxide are the outliers. Or we can use z-score to find out the outliers. You can calculate the z-score by these two formulas. Depending on the data from a population or sample. That is, x, the number, minus, mean, and divided by the standard deviation. After you obtain the z-score, if the absolute value of z-score is between 2 and 3, we say it is a normal outlier. If the absolute value is bigger than 3, we say that it is an extreme outlier. Here is the summary of Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we have learned how to use tables or graphs to describe the qualitative data. Also, we can describe the quantitative data by graphs or numerical measures. We have learned four graphs, dot plot, stem and leaf display, histogram, and box plot. For central tendency, we have learned mean, median, and mode. For variety, we have learned range, variance, and standard deviation. At the end, we learned percentile and how to detect the outliers using Z-score. That is about chapter 2.